Republican Party was born in the early 1850s by anti-slavery activists and individuals who believed that government should grant Western lands to settlers free of charge. The first informal meeting of the party took place in Rippon, Wisconsin, a small town northwest of Milwaukee. The first official Republican meeting took place on July 6, 1854 in Jackson, Michigan. The name Republican was chosen because it alluded to the equality and reminded individuals of Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party. At the Jackson Convention, the new party adopted a platform and nominated candidates for office in Michigan. In 1856, the Republicans became a national party when John C. Fremont was nominated for president under the slogan, free soil, free labor, free speech, free men, free Mont. Even though they were considered a third party because the Democrats and Whigs represented the two-party system, at the time, Fremont received 33% of the vote. Four years later, later, Abraham Lincoln became the first Republican to win the White House. The Civil War erupted in 1861 and lasted four grueling years. During the war, against the advice of the cabinet, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves. The Republicans of the day worked to pass the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery, the 14th, which guaranteed equal protection under the laws, and the 15th, which helped secure voting rights for African Americans. The Republican Party also played a leading role in securing women's right to vote. In 1896, Republicans were the first major party to favor women's suffrage. When the 19th Amendment finally was added to the Constitution, 26 of 36 state legislatures that had voted to ratify it were under the Republican control. The first woman elected to Congress was a Republican, Jeanette Rankin from Montana in 1917. Presidents during most of the late 19th century and the early part of the 20th century were, were Republicans. The White House was in Republicans' hands under Presidents Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Bush. Under the last two, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, the United States become, became the world's only superpower, winning the Cold War from the old Soviet Union and releasing millions from communist oppression. Behind all the elected officials, and the candidates of any political party are thousands of hardworking staff and volunteers who raise money, lick envelopes, and make phone calls that every winning campaign must have. The national structure of our party starts with the Republican National Com Committee. Each state has its own Republican state committee with a chairman and staff. The Republican structure goes right down to the neighborhoods where a Republican precinct captain captains every election day organization and organizes Republican workers to get out the vote. Most states ask voters when they register to express party preference. Voters don't have to do so, but registration lists let parties know exactly which voters they want to be sure to vote on election day. Just because voters register as Republican doesn't mean they need to vote that way. Many voters split their tickets, voting for and vote for candidates in both parties. But the National Party is made up of all registered Republicans in 50 states. They are the heart and soul of the party. Republicans have a long and rich history with basic principles. Individuals, not government, can make the best decisions. All people are entitled to equal rights, and decisions are best made close to home. The symbol of the Republican Party is the elephant. During the midterm elections, way back in 1874, Democrats tried to scare voters to thinking President Grant would seek to run an unprecedented third term. Thomas Nast, a cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, depicted Demo a Democratic jackass trying to scare a Republican elephant, and both symbols stuck. 
For a long time, Republicans have been known as the GOP. And party faithfuls thought it meant the grand old party. But apparently, the original meeting in 1875 was the gallant old party. And when autom automobiles were invented, it also became, came to mean get out and push. <laughs> That's still a pretty good slogan for Republicans who depend every campaign year on the hard work of hundreds of thousands of volunteers to get out and vote and push people to support the cause of the Republican Party. And this is from the Republican Party overview on the official GOP Facebook site. The history of our country is a history of change. Year after year, we have evolved, innovated, and overcome the major challenges of our time. America's genius throughout has been its ability to renew our promise to provide citizens the opportunity for a better life. And though our own history isn't perfect, the mission of the Democratic Party has been to make that promise a reality. Founded more than 200 years ago, the Democratic Party was born in response to the idea that government should represent the people and that wealth and status should not be an entitlement to rule. Change is the inescapable driver of history in the United States. Our, our party's founders believed then, just as we do now, that being a Democrat means meeting the challenges of changing time so that all Americans can prosper. That's why the people of this country have always turned to Democrats when times got rough. In the 1930s, Americans turned to Democrats and elected President Franklin Roosevelt to end the Great Depression. President Roosevelt offered Americans a new deal that put people back to work, stabilized farm prices, and brought electricity to rural homes and communities. Under President Roosevelt, Social Security established a promise that lasts to this day. Growing old would never again mean growing poor. In 1944, FDR signed the GI Bill, a historic measure that provided veterans with the opportunity to go to college and help move our country forward. These investments helped restore America's promise to be the land of opportunity and offered new avenues to expand the middle class. Harry Truman helped rebuild Europe after World War II with the Marshall Plan and oversaw the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. By integrating the military, President Truman helped to bring down barriers of race and gender and pave the way for civil rights advancements in the years that followed. In the 1960s, Americans again turned to Democrats and elected President John Kennedy to tackle the challenges of the new era. President Kennedy dared Americans to put a man on the moon, create, created the Peace Corps, and negotiated a treaty banning atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. And after President Kennedy's assassination, Americans looked to President Lyndon Johnson, who offered a new vision of a great society and signed into law the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. President Johnson's enactment of Medicare was a watershed moment in America's history that redefined our country's commitment to our seniors, offering a new promise that all Americans have the right to a healthy retirement. In 1976, in the wake of the Watergate scandal, Americans elected Jimmy Carter to restore dignity to the White House. He created the Department of Education and Energy and helped to forge a lasting peace between Israel and Egypt. In 1992, after 12 years of Republican presidents, record budget deficits, high unemployment, and increasing crime, Americans turned to Democrats once again and elected Bill Clinton to get America moving again. As president, Clinton balanced the budget, helped the economy add 23 million new jobs, and oversaw the longest period of peacetime economic expansion in history. And in 2008, Americans turned to Democrats and elected President Obama to reverse our country's slide into the largest economic downturn since the Great Depression and undo eight years of policies that favored the few over the many. Under President Obama's direction and congressional Democrats' leadership, we reformed the health care system that was broken and extended health insurance to 32 million Americans. We reined in a financial system that was out of control and delivered the toughest consumer protections ever enacted. We reworked our student loan system to make higher education more affordable and won the fight for equal pay for women. We passed the Recovery Act, which created or helped to save millions of jobs and made unprecedented investments in the major pillars of our country. From America's beginnings to today, people have turned to Democrats to meet our country's most pressing challenges. We are America's best hope to foster the promise and opportunity ingrained in our history. And we will succeed if we continue to govern by the same principles 
that made America the greatest nation on earth. This is from Who We Are on the Democratic National Committee website. Democratic communities abound in men of this kind. And in proportion, as the equality of conditions becomes greater, their multitude increases. Thus, democracy not only swells the number of working men, but leads men to prefer one kind of labor over another. And while it diverts them from agriculture, it encourages their taste for commerce and manufactures. This spirit may be observed even among the richest members of, community, of the community. In democratic countries, however opulent a man is supposed to be, he is almost always discontent with his fortune because he finds that he is less rich than his father was. And he fears that his sons will be less rich than himself. Most rich men in democracies are therefore constantly haunted by the desire of obtaining wealth. And they naturally turn their attention to trade and manufactures, which appear to offer the ready, ready, readiest and most efficient means of success. In this respect, they share the instincts of the poor without feeling the same necessities. Say, rather, they feel the most imperious of all necessities that have not sinking in the world. In aristocracies, the rich are at the same time the governing power. The attention that they unceasingly devote to important public affairs diverts them from the lesser cares that trade and manufacturers demand. But if an individual happens to turn his attention to business, the will of the body to which he belongs will immediately prevent him from pursuing it. For however men may declaim against the rule, the rule of numbers, they cannot wholly escape it. And even among those aristocratic bo aristoc bodies that most um, obstinately refuse to acknowledge the rights of the national majority, a private majority is formed which governs the rest. In de democratic countries where money does not lead those who possess it to political power, but often removes them from it, the rich do not know how to spend their leisure. They are driven into active life by the disquietude and the greatness of their desires, by the extent of their resources, and by the taste for what is extraordinary, which is almost always felt by those who rise, by whatever means, above the crowd. Trade is the only open road to them. In democracies, nothing is greater or more brilliant than commerce. It attracts the attention of the public and fills the imagination of the multitude. All energetic passions are directed towards it. Neither their own prejudice nor those of anybody else can prevent the rich from devoting themselves to it. The wealthy members of democracies never form a body which has manners and regulations of its own. The opinions <coughs> peculiar to their class do not restrain them, and the common opinions of their country urge them on. Moreover, as all the large fortunes that are found in the democratic community are of commercial growth. Many generations must succeed one another before their possessors can have entirely laid aside their habits of business. And this is um, what causes almost all Americans to follow industrial callings, volume two, section two, chapter 19.